So what I will be doing is taking you through what kind of patients transfer requests that we have, what are we able to transfer to ICU, and then what are the reasons which decide how we take our patients. You can see that every quarter of all about 500 or 400 patients, we are not able to take more than 100 or one out of four or five. That's the number. So how are we dealing with those? How do we take our decisions? These patients' requests, call <coughs> transfer requests, come from both the places, ward, wards mostly, but mostly from emergency because of the acute care load uh, is generally coming from emergency. So the issue for us, whether to admit, and once you have admitted, what is the microallocation of the resources and other things, and sustain or do not sustain, but I will put, keep mainly on this aspect. How do we prioritize? How do we prioritize based on the patient characteristics and about various therapies and the intervention that the patient need? It's not easy. You can't fix your eyes on any of these dots, can you? <laughs> so it's similar situation. Every patient is a challenge, and we try to focus on what we can do for the patient. But at the bottom, it remains that if we can benefit the patient, the patient requires us the most. And I'll, I'll try to explain it through these. So I have taken 730 patients' call, uh, the transfer request that we had this year. Out of these, we were able to shift almost half, which is much better than what it used to be. But this is because of an expansion in the size of the ICU. Most of these are infants. But you would see that we do not differentiate between those infants and older children in the number of patients based on the gender and, and age. They are similarly taken in the ICU. You can see that. These are all infants, and among the boys and girls, the number where they transferred from the ward or from emergency are similar. But what makes a difference here is the indication for transfer. And they have been broadly categorized for hemodynamic monitoring, respiratory monitoring, ventilation, neurological monitoring, or a combination of these. And what you would see that patients who need a combination of therapies, they are most likely to go. So the sickest one generally are likely to get in as compared to those who need simply some monitoring or patients where progression cannot be predicted, particularly neurological patients. So that's one way of our selecting patients coming to ICU. And then just to take you back to what happens to the patients who we have not transferred. Patients who got in, outcome based on the war, these are the patients we were not able to get transferred and the mortality among those remains same. So we, we at least are trying, but, and on our clinical assumption, the severity of illness is working very well. Some patients, of course, are still not able to find the place and I will discuss that later. Among the patients that come in with different diagnostic categories, you would see that this reflects actually the number of patients that we ordinarily see, patients with respiratory tract infections, patients with CNS infections, but all kind of ICU conditions, including uh, those following gastroenteritis and electrolyte imbalances, they come in. So, on basis of these, we try to look at what really is the outcome on, and are we really making a good decision? If you like to see that, the severity of illness, most of the patients who came in are having a very high PRISM score. Our median PRISM scores were about 15. And the number that came in, again, are the acutely, sorry, acutely ill patients coming mainly from the emergency. That means they are the ones who are in need. 
and those who were asked for transfer from the ward, if we felt in our way of looking at, uh, if they could be continued to be monitored in the ward, and only if they need some specific ICU therapies, then the priority would go to them. But when it came to a patients requiring ventilation, you can see that most of the patients, half of the patients coming to ICU were transferred because they needed ventilation. And we know that that's not, that cannot be done in a general ward. The, otherwise, we did not differentiate for patients coming from the ward or from the emergency. The number or the proportion that we took is almost similar. So underlying this is what we are saying is, is sub kind, some kind of subliminal trial is going on in our way of doing things where we transfer patients who, based on the severity of illness, and then based on what are the indications of a transfer. So this is the kind of patients that we would have, those who need interventions, which can be done only in ICU, and the diagnostic categories that even inside ICU, if you look at the patients that are being transferred are mostly those with the acute infectious illnesses where we know that outcome can be much better than those with the chronic illnesses with acute exacerbation. And that remains our current way of, man, a current way of transferring patients. And you can see here, the first priority goes to ventilation patients, patients with shock management, and then different other kind of therapies. And this is the outcome of these patients. 13% deaths, you can imagine that since we are taking the sickest of the patients, and when we analyzed various parameters, various variables that can affect the outcome, uh, the only outcome that came significant was the severity of illness assessed by PRISM. So in in other words, what it shows that most of our patients coming in ICU have only one most important characteristic in consideration, and that's the severity of illness. All other considerations are less important, but they are there, and we'll come to that. So here is PRISM score, which is the only variable on the multiple regression analysis that determine the transfer to an ICU. Among those patients who got transferred, you can see that these bars are similar, equal size, but these bars are not equal size. And so these three conditions, CNS infections, cardiac diseases, and systemic illnesses. Here we took the patients proactively because we know that there are more patients coming in because uh, these are the ones who the surgeons would take care. CNS infections, of course, disproportionately high because they can't be managed anywhere, and so are the systemic illnesses. And once again, what I, I'm trying to figure, bring out is those patients with acute systemic illnesses, acute in nature, find a place in our ICU. So that preference is clear. Most conditions that require long-term follow-up or multiple surgeries, like those with cardiac illness, or those have a huge economic burden, are not coming in the ICU. And these are the patients who require cardiac surgery, et cetera. So who is not coming now in the ICU and why they are not coming? This is analysis of those non-admissions there, is, there are various reasons, non-availability of ICU data, non-availability of ventilator, disease that we have assessed as poor prognosis, parents sometimes not willing for various reasons, financial could be one of them, and sometimes by the time that we have an ICU bed available, the patient has died, uh, which is what was brought earlier also, that it took four hours for a patient to get into ICU. So that is the kind of situation that we face often. This is the data few year, uh, four years ago, and you would find the change from here. One out of 163, 123 are the ones where there was no bed available. But then there is a significant number 
where financial or parental, parental reasons were the cause for non-admission. And this is the more recent data. Not, not much has changed, although bed availability has increased, so only <coughs> one third of patients are now not coming in because of uh, not bed be not being available. But then there is a large number that is still die before a bed is made available for them. Also, there is a small but significant number of patients where parents refuse or they say that they can't financially support it. And I must say that financial, lack of financial support is not because the hospital charges are high. Hospital doesn't, in fact, charge much. But what is uh, bothering them is even small amount of money that they need to spend for some of the consumables and all, or when patient has requirement for medicines which are not provided by the government's hospital, they, they are they clearly can't afford it and they don't want to get admitted in, hospital, in the ICU. But lack of ICU bed is now only in a smaller number as compared to the previous. Now, among those where lack of ventilator and resource constraint, this has been the major reason for patients not getting transferred. And only clearly is this about the financial part when they said, we just can't afford. Although we have created a bed, we are waiting for their transfer, and then the last minute they say no. Uh, which we respect as a part of the autonomy of patients' care decision. Sometimes parents just do not want their child to come in because they think it is, it is going to be futile, and that number is here. They consider that the patient's prognosis is poor, and therefore they do not want further care given. There is among the parents of non-transfer, not much of the gender differences, which otherwise do exist in our setup for bringing the child to the hospital. And you might have already noticed that only one third of patients who come to ICU are girls and two thirds are boys. But that's also the proportion of patients that are brought to hospital. But once it comes to ICU care, once a patient is brought to the hospital, the number where parents would deny or where the hospital would not be able to get them is not uh, different. In fact, what is very interesting is that those among the girls, those who were waiting for ICU transfer or those who could not get an ICU transfer, the mortality is half of what is in boys. Shows that women are much more hardier than us. Indication for transfer didn't make any difference. So what, again, has comes out is that need of the family, if the need of the patients are less, or their need of family is considered more important, they are not going to get the patient in ICU. And that's where the financial constraints come in. Sometimes parents decide on basis of age, gender, but in our setup at least, this is not now working. It has improved, much improved than before. Uh, do we intervene in the, making this decision? Once parents say that they do not want the patient to be admitted to the ICU, we do not force them. Uh, we do explain to them that there is a way that this child would be benefited, but we do not. Because we, our experiences in such situation, uh, we are made more responsible for the decision. And we take a decision together rather than force a decision. I mentioned about financial constraints, but again, bringing it up here, parents not willing, financial constraints, almost 20% of patients are not able to come among those who are refused by the family is because of finances. 9% of overall, but among those where parents refuse, that number goes twice. And this is because government contributes in 25% for health expenses. Most of the families then have to do out-of-pocket spending. And most of the time, it is out of a duty that they feel. Uh, sometimes, especially in very sick patients, there had been situations where they have sold uh, their assets. 
to help the patient recover. And in all such situations, we do guide them to get advice from social worker and others. And we try to get money for them from different sects. From states, we do have a kind of uh, arrangement where poor patients <coughs> are given funds for certain defined requirements. So the hospital will purchase it for them and get it to them. Charity, there are non-governmental organizations working with our unit and hospital that they are willing to help those patients with material and medicines. And then, of course, we continuously work for minimizing the use, like we would be probably using some of the material again and again and not have too many disposables. Insurance is not the one which is paying for most of the patients in our ICU yet. And that's the reason, because of the financial reasons, patients are not coming in the ICU. And there is a small number of patients, 9% of those, where we take a decision that patient is not coming in the ICU because we consider that there is a poor prognosis there. And that we explain to the parents and this is where we do it without malice because patient who is vacating a bed, who is occupying a bed must be really benefited by it. Once in a while, we do end up with a situation where we are forced to take a patient with non-curable disease. Patient is there for a few weeks, few months, and ultimately when the futility of that care is realized by the parent, parents, they take the child home. Such patients with neuromuscular disorders, brain dead patients, uh, it's an ongoing struggle. But there are patients where we would straight away say, no, this is not the patient for ICU. And that number is 9% of all requests that are made to us. So in summary, I would say that ICU establishing is actually only just the beginning of the whole challenge. Challenge is really to maintain how your ICU beds are utilized, especially in our countries of Africa, Asia, Latin America, where we have resources which are very limited, and we should therefore be distributing it to those who can be benefited. And as I showed you, our major way of doing it is the serious severity of illness and the outcome which is possibly the better than the other patients. You need to have work on these principles of beneficence for the patient and without malice, normal patients. And clinical and economic consideration then comes in uh, where the parents take decision. So what I have shown you is uh, in our ICU pattern of cases being referred to PICU varies from time to time and I'm sure they vary from institution to institution. Analysis of the nature of the ICU calls and their outcome can give us some insight into what local decision making is on, based on and it can also help us in planning. And you can clearly see that we do need more ICU beds because only one out of five is able to come in. Thank you very much. For